Estimados colegas de Parlaméricas, un saludo cordial especialmente a nuestros miembros de habla inglesa y francesa que son parte del Consejo de la Administración. Les doy la más cordial bienvenida en el marco de la décima séptima Asamblea Plenaria de Parlaméricas, la misma que ha sido posible gracias al apoyo de la Asamblea de Costa Rica. Para esta ocasión hemos preparado un programa especial en torno a la economía circular, un concepto nuevo, innovador, que rompe paradigmas y que sobre todo garantiza un mundo más sostenible y unas economías más limpias, sobre todo ahora que el mundo entero ha estado marcado por la pandemia del COVID-19 y las grandes secuelas que esta pandemia han dejado. Definitivamente la CEPAL ha hecho un análisis del impacto económico que esta pandemia tiene sobre los países de la región y se espera un decrecimiento promedio de nuestras economías de alrededor de un 9.1% en el Producto Interno Bruto y un crecimiento de la tasa de desempleo a un 13.5%. Sin embargo, a más de ser esto una tragedia para muchos países, puede convertirse en la oportunidad histórica de implementar nuevos modelos económicos que nos garanticen sobre todo sostenibilidad, que nos garanticen crecimiento, que nos garanticen una afinidad con el medio ambiente y unas economías más limpias. La economía circular nos ofrece un enfoque sistémico integral de grandes beneficios, sobre todo para la sociedad, para las empresas y para el medio ambiente. Y también nos ofrece alternativas de generación de capital, tanto en el ámbito económico, natural y social. Definitivamente nos vamos a enfrentar durante estos próximos meses a grandes desafíos. Y durante este evento del 17 sesión plenaria tendremos la oportunidad de compartir con expertos en estos temas en donde aprenderemos otras dimensiones de la economía circular y nos ofrecerán herramientas que nos permitan implementar mejores armas para la recuperación económica en cada uno de nuestros países. Estamos ante el desafío más grande que tenemos. Las decisiones que asumamos y las políticas que implementemos marcarán la diferencia para una recuperación económica que sea más amigable con el medio ambiente, que nos ayude a mejorar los estándares económicos, pero sobre todo que nos apunte al desarrollo en un marco de inclusión y de equidad que son extremadamente importantes. Les agradezco por ser parte de esta décima séptima sesión y estoy seguro que todo lo que aprendamos será de extremado provecho para la aplicación de las políticas en cada uno de nuestros países. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you um, for, for that, uh, President Cabezas. We would now like to invite um, our uh, member of the Legislative Assembly, Maria uh, Ines Solis from Costa Rica, who is a member of the Parliamericas Board of Directors and our host here uh, today, as you may all not realize, but we're all together in Costa Rica right now. That's where we are. And so we would like to have uh, Maria Ines Solis, please, uh, you please take the floor. Thank you, Alicia. Good morning to parliamentary colleagues and friends of Parliamericas. I know you all will wish to be here in Costa Rica in this warm weather, and I hope that will be happen anytime soon. First to all, I would like to thank my colleague on the Parliamericas Board of Directors, Bridget Asinet George, for her support and for joining me in this inauguration of this event and the President of Parliamericas, Elizabeth Cabezas, for her leadership and the kind words she shared through this video message. The Legislative Assembly of Costa Rica is honored to have such a select group of participants in this plenary assembly and extends a warm welcome to this important international forum in which we will discuss the goals of entering a circular economy. For Costa Rica, it is an honor to host the 17th Parliamericas Plenary Assembly during the month of November, which we are holding virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Once again, as is done every year at the Parla Plenary Assembly, Parliamericas offers parliamentarians a forum for productive dialogue 
and a change of legislative best practices on the inter-American matters that concern us most. As you know, on this occasion, the central term will be the circular economy in the context of public policies and legislation that promote and foster sustainable and equitable production systems, particularly considering the next economy stimulus package from the post-COVID-19 recovery and the achievement of the 2030 agenda. We hope that our discussion on this topic will allow us to share the experiences of our respective legislators and motivate the representative of the Parliamerica's Plenary Assembly to make decisions with our parliaments that we can benefit society. Costa Rica has always been known as the first class ecotouristic destination, recently receiving the Champions of the Earth Award, the highest destination offered by the United Nations Environment Program in response of the country's nature protection policies and its commitment to program of reducing carbon emissions and combating climate change. Today, we are graded to discuss circular economy because it is without a doubt an excellent opportunity to analyze the importance of this new production model. The implementation of a circular economy seeks to compel companies and institutions to reinvent themselves by taking advantage of our resources they have at their disposal, thereby achieving more efficient management in the use of each of their components. The current model of management and production of good six short-term benefits and it has led to an unsustainable environmental situation. That is why a transition toward a circular economy seeks to improve the economy and the social aspect of each sector through reducing, reusing and recycling. It is important that the Legislative Assembly of Costa Rica include and promote circular economy as a topic of discussion in order to make change to legislation or create new standards with a goal of introducing the principle of this new economic model and having them form part of the country's public policy. We have created the Committee of Institutions Sustainability to oversee environmental policy, including, among other tasks, the transition toward a sustainable parliament. As a first step, as a vice president of this parliament in the period 2018-2019, we established guidelines to prohibit the purchase of single-use plastic with a goal of ensuring that the highest branch of the Republic contributes to improving the environment. In addition, in the 2018-2019 period, the legislative board I was a member of signed an agreement between the Legislative Assembly and the Costa Rican Institute of Technology for the collection, processing, and classification of recycle and or reusable solid waste generated by the institution. Next year, we will be implementing the Marchamo Ecologico, a voluntary carbon offset program for parliamentarians and parliamentary staff, as well as promoting the Blue Offices campaign, which will regard zero pollution offices and departments, acknowledging the responsive, responsible environmental management in according with the global of sustainable parliament. In October 19, in this year, we inaugurated the new parliamentary headquarters, which is a 21 story tower that will host the legislative chamber, committees, and the offices of 57 legislators in the environmentally friendly space. 
This is a clear example of a transition toward a circular economy in public institutions. Within the legislative assembly, many bills can promote to make the leap toward a circular economy, including proposals to improve waste management, save energy and use resources sustainably. We need to promote policies to involve all sectors of local governments, communities and public private partnerships that can incorporate these new development models. This will allow us to achieve sustainable growth, improve competitiveness, save on cost, and even create jobs. Circular economy is not about a new way to understanding society and the economy from an innovative stand, standpoint in which we are all working together. It is time to reduce and rethink production so that from conception, products have a roadmap to follow once their use has come to an end. It is time to repair, recycle, reuse, and remake. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, uh, Marini Solis, uh, for those kind remarks. It's so, we're so grateful to be with you here in Costa Rica today. Again, thank you for hosting us. I do wish we were there with you in person, if only to be a little bit warmer for myself. <laughs> and such a beautiful country. I'd like, like to invite um, uh, the Honorable Bridget Anisette George, Speaker of the House of Representatives from Trinidad and Tobago and Parl America's board member to offer us some welcome remarks. Good morning to Madam President. Good morning to our hostess, Senora Queiroz, to my Caribbean parliamentary colleagues from Antigua and Barbuda, Bahamas, Bahamas, Barbados, to our colleagues from Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, St. Kitts and Nevis, to my Canadian parliamentary colleagues. And I will beg your indulgence if you would permit me to spend special greetings to the members of my own delegation, which among them comprises some young and first time parliamentarians in the persons of Senator Lizama Lee Singh and Senator Bartholomew, the Honorable Brian Manning, who is the MP, who is the minister in the Ministry of Finance, and also to our Minister of Tourism, Senator Randall Mitchell, and our independent Senator Timal. Good morning to young leaders, youth leaders present, to our technical experts, Mr. Oswald and Mr. Lozado, and to the Director General and the supportive staff of Pal Americas. On behalf of the Board of Pal Americas, I'm delighted to welcome you to this first working session of the 17th Plenary Assembly of Pal Americas. Your interest in this topic, as demonstrated by your attendance, is very encouraging for the navigation of our immediate future and I therefore thank you for carving out the time from your schedule to participate. I wish to recognize the keen efforts of the President of Pal Americas, Senora Elizabeth Cabezas, for being one of the key drivers of this year's theme and to our board member Maria Inez Solis Carreros of the Legislative Assembly of Costa Rica, I express our gratitude for so graciously hosting this plenary assembly. And for me, I don't have to be virtually there. I have been to Costa Rica and it is a beautiful country. So I thank you. Last year at the 16th plenary assembly held in Asuncion, Paraguay, our discussions focused on the role of parliaments in the implementation of Agenda 2030. As we all know, although the Sustainable Development Goals consist of 17 specifically identified goals, the goals are interdependent for ensuring the overall objective of leaving no one behind in ensuring peace, security, 
equality, and sustainability for all. Further, as parliamentarians, we understand that we are uniquely placed in our representative, legislative, accountability, and oversight rules to ensure the attainment of the SDGs in our respective countries. The work in, this working session gives us an opportunity to explore in some depth SDG 12, sustainable production and consumption, and the how to achieve sustainable consumption and production by employing the circular economy. According to the issue brief for SDG 12, developed by UN Environment, the concept of sustainable consumption and production contributes to resilient societies in several ways. It reduces scarcity of resources while also ensuring future security of supply. It mitigates environmental degradation and climatic impacts. It aims to protect human health. It promotes the minimization of the creation of waste and ensures that waste is managed and disposed of by environmentally sound and safe practices when generated. Quite frankly, in my readings about SDG 12, it takes me back to my childhood and many of us who knew our grandmothers and in some cases for the youth among us, our great grandmothers, we may relate to what I have realized. My grandmother would say, eat little and live long. My grandmother would find other uses for old garments and even discarded newspapers. She would not use anything but vinegar and water to clean the window panes. And of course, containers weren't discarded. They were turned into go boxes. She would also say, waste not, want not. Intrinsic in what I have recounted was a philosophy, philosophy of responsible consumption and an appreciation that resources were finite, even if my grandmother didn't use such fancy terms. But our thinking from my grandmother's time has long changed. That change is reflected in our economies, just as in most of the world's economies which have been described by the experts as based on a linear model. We produce recklessly, reckless to its environmental impact. We consume oblivious of our overconsumption. We discard and produce waste with impunity. That linear model has been at the greatest cost to us and future generations as it has jeopardized the sustainability of our planet. The linear model has resulted in a diminution of our natural resources, resulted in an entrenched inequalities, and has generated untold environmental threats and health risks. Just to use a few statistics, which we are all familiar with, but which always helps to contextualize a discussion for me. Each year, approximately one third of all food produced ends up rotting, although approximately one billion people go undernourished and another billion go hungry. It is anticipated that if the world population reached 9.5 billion by the year 2050, we would need the equivalent of three planets of natural resources to sustain current lifestyles. Man is polluting water faster than nature can recycle and purify water in river and lakes. In, 20, in the year 2002, the motor vehicle stock in OCD countries was 550 million, of which 75% were personal cars. And it was anticipated by 2020, vehicle car ownership would increase to in and around 750 million cars. All of that data, I cite the UN Environment Program. Even as I know it, I find it startling every time I recite it. In summary, the linear model has not only proven inefficient, but it is not sustainable. It diminishes natural resources, names the environment, promotes climate change, widens the poverty gap, 
increases the marginalization of groups and is inimical to our health. The recent pandemic undeniably has heightened the contradictions of our existing economic model. When our economic activity slowed down to almost nothing, the planet breathed. Carbon emissions went down. In both traditional media and social media, we were shown pictures of nature taking back its own. However, as gratifying as these results were, we are faced with a conundrum. People were losing jobs and poverty levels were increasing. Our governments have had to institute emergency measures to find and provide financial support to our most vulnerable groups, the populations which were increasing rapidly. Specifically to the existing gender disparities, UN Women in its comprehensive publication Spotlight on Gender, COVID-19 and the SDGs has opined that the pandemic lays bare women's precarious economic security and it has negatively impacted the gender divide as relates to almost every SDG, including access to quality education, the empowerment of women and girls, access to clean water and sanitation, and it has increased, as we all well know, the incidence of domestic violence. COVID-19 certainly has demonstrated that we have to pursue avenues of wealth generation which are not incompatible with the sustainability of the environment. In the words of the UN Environment Program, resource decoupling and impact decoupling are needed to promote sustainable consumption and production patterns and to make the transition towards a greener and more socially inclusive global economy. This group, the circular economy is seen as a model which will promote sustainability and remove inequality. And in one of the best definitions I have found of what is this circular economy is that by the UN Environmental Program. And it says that the circular economy is really about services and producing products that minimize the use of natural resources and toxic materials as well as the emissions from waste and pollutants over the life cycle of the service and of the product so as not to jeopardize the needs of future generations. It is not difficult for us to begin to imagine the many ways in which the employment of this circular model can benefit us as island states. Having small land mass, the linear model has generated a lot of waste, producing unsightly, unregulated dumping grounds, which mar our environment, and toxic landfills, which pollute our air quality, and through leaching, threaten the safety of our natural water sources. Our waste finds its ways in our water channels and our oceans, resulting in flooding and the littering of our beaches and oceans, threatening our marine life as a source of food and also damaging our coral leaves on which our tourism relies. And of course, we have not begun to speak of the long-term ecological damage which has occurred. As I paint the above picture, my mind turns almost immediately to my country's experience with plastics as a classic challenge with waste, although surely not singular in that regard. However, study on material flow analysis in support of the circular economy development using plastics as a case study done by Millet, Hull, and Williams in October of 2019 has demonstrated, among other things, that by employing a circular economy model using 2016 figures, approximately 49,000 metric tons of plastic could have been diverted from our landfills through recycling to produce other plastic projects and in the utilization of energy for cement production and as a construction 
additive. But we have some practical examples. We have established a beverage container facility. And this is just outside of the city limits of Port of Spain, at which innovative recycling waste technologies are applied to plastics, glass bottles and jars, beverage cans, and cartoons to produce PET feedstock. This feedstock is used locally and is exported. The feedstock is used to produce construction material and other plastic products, such as furniture and other plastic containers. The wastewater produced in the processing of the beverage containers is filtered and reviews several times in the operation of this facility before being disposed. In our own parliament, we have banned the use of single-use plastics altogether. We then have the example of our Trinidad Generation Unlimited, which has also employed circular economy in the generation of power. At Trinidad Generation Unlimited, they use a combined cycle to reduce their carbon footprint, which results in producing approximately 50% more energy using no additional fuel. The exhaust heat from the gas turbine is recovered to power the steam turbine and which significantly improves overall power plant efficiency. Another advantage of that process is that it's less carbon, carb carbon dioxide intense than other fossil fuels. This means that the generators in combined cycle plants are one of the key power generating technologies in the battle against climate change. That uh, project has also employed recycling and it recycles a variety of waste streams including paper, glass, wood, cardboard, plastic, scrap iron, fluorescent bulbs, batteries, and e-waste. And the plant has opened up its recycling program also to its employees, which means that the employees bring their own domestic recyclable items from home to the plant. We have also introduced a LED bulb initiative in our country which is aimed at producing and promoting uh, responsible consumption in the area of effective energy efficiency. And the government had launched an initiative of distributing 1.6 million LED bulbs to 400,000 households free of charge. The distribution of the bulbs commenced in September 2020 and this is an important initiative because it is found that 17% of our carbon footprint is due to incandescent lighting. We've also in our current national budget, national budget 2021, which was passed last month in our parliament, we have introduced measures which are aimed at encouraging responsible consumption and reducing emissions in the area of transport by rationalizing the new and used car markets for the importation of vehicles. There are approximately 1 million cars in Trinidad and Tobago, and we only have a population of 1.4 million people. So that all tax concessions on the importation of private motor cars were removed. However, in the case of hybrid cars, electric cars, CNG cars, and small engines below 1,500 cc's, we have used the lowest rates of duties and taxes. So that will encourage the use of such cars. From January 2021, we'll only be allowed to import foreign used cars under the age of three years. And also, the importation of uh, foreign used cars will be cut by 30%. So 
so that there will be a quota system for foreign used cars and also there will be a quota system for the importation of new cars come January 2021. I've looked at our national energy policy, which was um, made in 2018. And in the chapter devoted to economic development, our government has recognized the need to foster economic growth in tandem with fostering an environmentally responsible society. I thought that the stated policy was so well laid out that it should be quoted verbatim and itself. Integrated environmental considerations into the way businesses conducted reduces economic vulnerability and drives economic growth. Greening the economy is therefore a means to strengthen the country's economic performance through the introduction of new value-added economic activities, increased efficiency across all sectors, reduction of waste, and the generation of green jobs. One of the stated ways in that document to achieve the objective of that policy is to encourage the growth and development of a circular economy in which waste is revalued and resources are recirculated locally as much as possible. I expect that in all our countries, we find at least policy statements which mirror the Trinidad and Tobago National Environmental Policy 2018. As a result of the pandemic, our parliaments and executives shall be considering recovery measures. This working session could not be more timely as a precursor of matters in which we will be soon engaged. And therefore, we are presented with an opportunity to turn the challenge of COVID-19 into the triumph of sustainability with the knowledge of the how to do so. The circular economy, economy must be interwoven into our economic recovery measures. This topic would surely lend to very vibrant and enlightening exchanges among us as we listen to our respective challenges and in the learning from our respective success stories to chart our journey forward. I therefore should not, it therefore should not be surprising that the concept of circular economy is considered one of the pathways in achieving SDG 1, no poverty. SDG 8, decent work and economic growth. SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. And SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. It is a way to generate wealth, but it also ensures that there is ecological balance. Our task as parliamentarians is to make it happen. But before we get to work, I have the honor to launch two new publications of parliamentarians. The first is the Guide on Supporting a Post-COVID-19 Green Economy Recovery. This first is a guide um, with the objective of providing a brief synopsis of the reasons for which a green economic recovery is essential for a more equitable and environmentally sound future and to guide parliamentarians on supporting this endeavor. The guide provides an overview of the science illustrating the severity of the climate and environmental crisis, as well as the social, environmental, and economic benefits of investing in a green future. The publication also discusses how the 2030 Agenda, the nationally determined contributions that are part of the Paris Agreement and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction are important frameworks that can provide a blueprint to guide parliamentarians as they consider proposals to foster an economic recovery. It provides both a selection of recommended policy actions and a checklist of questions that parliamentarians can provide to promote a green 
and sustainable economic recovery through their representation, legislative and oversight duties. It integrates strategies for gender mainstreaming streaming, and impact assessments on vulnerable populations and where possible, including opportunities for public participation. And I highly recommended it, having regard to the fact that I had a peek at it in advance. The second publication is a guide on green parliaments, action to promote sustainable practices within parliaments. I also have the pleasure of presenting this publication. This guide outlines actions that parliaments can take to apply green practice internally. It provides guidance to start a dialogue within parliaments to measure their current environmental footprint and develop a plan to improve their sustainable practices and consciousness. It reminds us that not only can parliaments positively contribute to the climate agenda through their functions of lawmaking, representation, oversight, and budgetary approval, but they can also reduce the environmental footprint of their institutions. I therefore, in closing, wish again to convey my gratitude on your behalf to the Legislative Assembly of Costa Rica for being our host. I want to in advance thank our moderator, Senator Rosa Galvez from Canada, the Vice President of Parliament America's Parliamentary Network on Climate Change, for lending her skill in guiding our deliberations. To our expert panelists, Mr. Oswald and Ms. Rosaldo, who will impart their knowledge and expertise, and to our staff of Parliament Americans, who have so carefully put all of this together, and without, without, without whom this event could not take place, I also say thank you. And of course, to all our participants for their contributions, which they shall all give. I thank you, and I wish us a very successful morning. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you so much for that. We learned so much about Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Um, to before moving into the next part of our program, colleagues, you will all recall that I, I always invite us to turn on our cameras. It's time for the group photo. You can indulge me, please. I mean, it's not the same. It's nicer in person. But if you turn on your camera for me, give us a big smile. My colleagues will take our picture. And it's kind of like we're all together in Costa Rica here. So smiles now. And colleagues are going to take pictures. Uh, please join us. Cameras on. All right, Maria, you're supposed to give me a thumbs up when we're ready. Yes, just just a few more minutes. Sorry. <laughs> And I mean seconds, not minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting that that shaky smile look now. Enough enough time to put on our sunblock. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Costa Rica. <laughs> We're in Costa Rica, yes. I'm giving a th thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you everyone for that. It's so nice to be here with you all. All right, here we are. Now we will move next to part in our agenda is I'd like to introduce Senator Rosa Galvez uh, from Canada, who uh, and we are delighted she's here to join us at, and, and moderate the session for us today. And so Senator Galvez, I turn, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, take it away. Yes. Uh, is my microphone? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Okay, hello. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be able to moderate today's session and share this space with you. I feel the warm of the Caribbean. I feel the warm of Costa Rica and the northern part of South America. Um, we, we have distinguished subject matter experts today. We have fellow legislators, parliamentary staff, and youth leaders. Um, Today's working session will consist of a panel discussion between two remarkable panelists, 
Mr. David Oswald, founder and president of Design and Environment, and Ms. Virginia Rose Lozada, sustainability specialist from the International Labor Organization Office for the Caribbean. This discussion will be followed by a multi-stakeholder dialogue in which we will invite parliamentarians, parliamentary staff, and youth leaders to participate and consider the ways through which we can transition away from a linear economy. We will end with a short evaluation and closing remarks by the Speaker of the House of the Assembly of Santa Lucia, Andy Daniel, Vice President of the Caribbean of the Parla Americas Parliamentary Network on Climate Change. The objective of this session is to learn from each other about the innovative steps and good practices we can take within our respective functions to improve our countries and build back forward using circular economies. I don't want to repeat what my colleagues, um, legislators, guests have said about their, um, their views on, um, on um, circular economy. I just want to just reiterate that, uh, you know, the linear extract, transform, use, waste economic model relied on infinite quantities of cheap, easily accessible natural resources and energy. But this model is inconsistent with the finite resource planet Earth in which we all live. It, it has reached its physical limits and we know it. Now, we have to be wise. We know that COVID has induced um, a reduction on humanity's ecological footprint because of a reduction of our acquisition power and uh, buying power. And it has changed our habits. But we shouldn't be taking this as a celebration. The pandemics, the lockdowns, the inequality of the impacts have taken us all by surprise. This crisis, its impact on our, in our government response, we are at a historical moment. We parliamentarians, we have an important duty to fulfill. We are accountable for the success or failure of the response and we must use every opportunity to build a more resilient society. We have to use this pandemic as a big, big lesson and come out wiser. We need to see it as an opportunity to provoke and promote a constructive and inclusive, inclusive conversation on possible ways to move forward together. So circular economy is a concept that goes in that direction of resetting the economical model conserving natural resources, restoring and regenerating them by design and aim to keep products, components, and materials at their highest utility and value at all times in a closed circular model. We have to distinguish and consider and integrate both the technical and the natural cycles, whether they are chemical, biological, or ecological. Circular economy seeks to ultimately decouple the economic development from a finite resource consumption. Its efficiency enables to attain key policy objectives, such as generating clean economic growth, creating jobs, and reducing environmental impact, including carbon emissions. My office just released um, a document, a white paper, discussion on the clean and just recovery that I'm going to share with you in the chat room. And without further talk, we will start with our panel. So, we, do we still me? Okay. So, panelists will be as pre-established, no, sorry. Um, I will introduce our first speaker. Mr. David Oswald is a designer and environmental scientist. He is founder of the Design and Environment, whose team brings deep expertise in environmental science and creative design to the most progressing environmental challenge of the planet. He is called upon by international organizations such as the United Nations for decision support in climate change adaptation and risk analysis. And his creative expertise has been showcased on major global projects. So 
Mr. David Osvald, the floor is yours. Oh, why, thank you. Um, so I'm going to, first off, uh, um, good morning uh, and to uh, honorable speakers and national representatives. Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak at this forum. Uh, thank you to colleagues at Parlo Americas and also uh, good morning to colleagues from the United Nations who I believe are also on this call as well. Um, I'm going to follow, um, the way I'm going to handle this is just basically follow the directed questions that I've been given uh, and then also provide some examples of, um, of work that we've done and, and we're doing right now uh, just to kind of ground the discussion a bit. So the first question that I've, um, I've been given is, uh, why is a circular economy such an important topic in, in the current socioeconomic climate that COVID-19 has caused? Um, so, I mean, it's a very interesting circumstance we're in. And I think what I'd like to say to groups and, that I've talked to and, and students I teach and so forth is that what COVID-19 has done is it's exposed the world to serious cracks in our socioeconomic systems. Um, ranging from our lack of preparedness to a pandemic of this sort, uh, also to the profound interconnectedness uh, of our economies and some of the shared vulnerabilities that we have. And it's exposed us to just simply how unresilient uh, some of our economies are, and therefore it forces us to think in terms of building a stronger and more profound adaptive capacity and resilience. Uh, and even to start of thinking of things in socioeconomic and socio-ecological uh, resilience terms. So I think um, also that the onset of COVID-19 exposes us to this, uh, what I like to say is the fragile relationship between humanity uh, and uh, as a whole and nature. Because if you think of it, I mean, the running hypothesis is that uh, one small virus crossed over from uh, from nature to human, uh, to society in a wet market in China uh, that has essentially ground our global economy to a halt. So if you think of it in those terms, some small incident leading to su such catastrophic global impacts, it really causes us, it forces us to think about uh, exactly what other risks are out there and, and the way we have to look at these problems. So the next question I would pose is, well, what does this have to do with the circular economy? Well, the whole mindset of circular economy thinking uh, is predicated on having a systems perspective in how, how we go about modeling organizational community and national economies uh, and mapping out um, visually and, and spatially how inflows and outflows of economic activity actually work. Um, so this can go from simply doing life cycle analysis for individual products uh, at an organizational level, like a business, uh, to looking at national economies as a whole. So in order to better prepare ourselves uh, it, to these kind of disturbances or surprises, as we say in the literature, we have to start to model resilience uh, in our socioeconomic planning and also consider socioecological parameters. So it's not just about socioeconomic systems, but we have to also think about the coupling of society to ecosystems or ecological systems. Now in the Caribbean and Latin America, I think it's particularly, particularly in the Caribbean, we do a lot of work in the Caribbean, which I'll be sharing with you, uh, is there's, there's such a large dependence on foreign tourism as an example. It's a perfect example of how fragile these economies are with ranging from 30 to 50% of the GDP dependent on uh, foreign tourism activity, economic activity resulting from tourism. So uh, if we add to this situation, this problem, some of the other disturbances that are being faced by small island developing states and other countries in Latin America, um, the argument for circular economy thinking and resilience oriented perspectives I think is even greater. Um, so one example is building resilience to climatic change through enhanced adaptive capacity. So this is something that you know, we're working on which is closely related to the circular economy. And to give you some grounding in that, I'm just gonna put through some links of, of things that we're, we have done and we're currently working on. So one aspect of this uh, is, is data sharing. So this is a project uh, linked to a project that we did with the USAID and the five C's uh, where we've um, worked on and working with different national MET services and regional MET services to synchronize data gathering and data standards and protocols for climate data. 
Another aspect of this problem that needs attention is risk analysis. And often when we deal with financial organizations such as banks or uh, investors, uh, a lot of the, the vernacular that we have to use with them is around the whole idea of risk. It's not only about doing the right thing, it's about doing the thing that is going to reduce the exposure that different organizations have, particularly when you're dealing with large amounts of investment. So this example that I'm going to put through here is some work that we've done in actually in Trinidad and Tobago, where we did agricultural risk mapping. And again, this is reliant of, uh, on, on getting data about where there's risk exposure to flooding and, and landslides and droughts and so forth. And as uh, a follow-up to that work, um, this is a, a video you hopefully will be able to download. So we worked in Trinidad and Tobago working with a group called ICA, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, to do risk mapping where there's exposure to, food, to the food supply. But shortly after we did that work and identified exactly where in the country there was great exposure, if you look at that video, floods came, heavy rains like they're experiencing now in Jamaica and other countries in, in the Caribbean and Latin America, and, and did exactly what we estimated was going to happen, which was profoundly impact not only the actual agricultural producers, but the infrastructure that supports agricultural production in Trinidad, Tobago. Another thing I think is important to consider within uh, the circular economy is looking at the synergies between different agendas. Now, already in the introductory comments, uh, there was an allusion made to the sustainable development goals. So it's not only about efficiency and looking at how do we make things more optimal in terms of production, we also need to look at what are the different kind of object objectives within the paradigm of sustainable development, such as uh, reducing land degradation to reach land, degra land degradation neutrality by 2030, as well as conservation of biodiversity and sustainable ecosystem management. So here's a link to uh, some of the, the work that we've done with uh, in collaboration with the UNCCD, um, and which is the UN Convention for Combating Desertification on looking at how do we can reverse land degradation and restore land so, thank, so uh, Mr. Oswald, thank you very much for this, the answering of this first question. Yeah. Uh, let me introduce our second panelist, uh, Ms. Virginia Rose Lozada, that works in the ELO Decent Work Team and Office for the Caribbean as a sustainable enterprise specialist. Prior to her current role, Virginia was the global coordinator and the lead technical officer for the ILO's Women Entrepreneurship Development Program and the Know About Business Program. She has supported entrepreneurships and SME initiatives, programs and policies, targeting women and youth in over 15 countries in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So this is a dialogue. So the speakers have pre-established questions. So we have one that was answered by Mr. Osval, why is circular economy such an important topic? So then now is the turn for Mrs. Uh, Lozada, that uh, if she can answer the question, how can a just transition toward more sustainable economies, including developing a blue economy, help with diversification and job creation? So let's say, I don't know, between five and seven minutes, and then we continue uh, with questions to each of our panelists. Um, Mrs. Lozada, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and, and good morning to everyone. Bonjour à tous. C'est un plaisir d'être ici. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I think it's, um, it's a great question and it, I think we will, it, it'll go nicely with um, kind of following up with what David was just finishing off on. Um, and as you can imagine, coming from the International Labor Organization, you know, what I will be bringing in is also the labor dimension as we look towards uh, moving towards a sustainable economy. Um, and the question itself, I think, brings a lot of these, these terms that I think it's good that we seek to, to break them down a little bit um, as, we, as we move forward. And um, as the question stated, um, you know, it's, it's about the just transition. And, and I think, as we've heard from the, from the previous speakers, it is clear that uh, climate change and, and natural disasters you know, present a significant challenge uh, for sustainable development for the Caribbean. We were hearing this morning about the floods in St. Lucia. You know, we have from the very dramatic um, scenes of Dorian in Bahamas and Maria in, in Dominica to 
the, you know, the, the regular floodings in, in different countries in, in the Caribbean. And, um, you know, in the region, we are really um, uh, being victims of, say, of uncontrolled, the uncontrolled climate impacts um, that damage infrastructure, that disrupt business activity, um, that destroy jobs. And so it's really important that we, you know, continue this conversation about changing the way that we produce but also that we consume um, and that it, how we, we do that will have profound changes to, to the world of work. Now, um, in the question, we talk about just transition um, and just transition comes you know, back to the 1970s and it, it actually came and it emerged from the workers movement in the US. And it was that the workers in um, coal and, 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 and dirty, let's say industries seeing how there was going to be a shift towards towards greening and how are they going to not be left behind and so from the international labor organization perspective within this um tra transi just transition and looking for sustainable enterprises we we really look at how um the structural transformation of the economies um need to take in that socially just and inclusive transition um, a just transition requires that we seek to move forward a zero carbon emission economy or a low carbon emission economy um, done in a way that secures the livelihoods of those who may be displaced. And as we've, you know, within the ILO, we've done several studies and we see that um, within the greening of the economies, you know, we will see effects on four levels within terms of jobs, you know, we will and, and within the question we talk about job creation, but we also have to look into and consider that, you know, yes, um, we can see how new jobs will be created as we move towards a sustainable enterprises as new sectors emerge or supporting um, services to greening um, sectors will emerge. But then there will also be some jobs that will be replaced um, and there will be even jobs that will be eliminated. There will be many jobs that are, are transformed. Um, we see um, information around, you know, 15 million jobs being created, net jobs created, um, as we go into um, the greening of, of the economy. But it is also looking in towards what is the quality of those, of those jobs, right? So um, in terms of diversification, um, you know, that, that has been a topic that has been on the agenda of the Caribbean for, for, for decades. Um, we are in a region that is over dependent on either tourism and in some countries like, for example, Suriname or Guyana in terms of extractive industries. So greening um, and the green jobs may be a mean to diversify the economy, though to do so, um, we really have to be, uh, there has to be really an overall commitment and will. And, and an understanding of what that means. And, you know, later on, and we'll, also, we'll, we'll, we'll dig deeper into the, into the circular economy. And I think there, um, we, there was one of the, of the speakers before um, said it, it, it was, it, it, it really requires a complete shift in how we are looking at things. And we have to be very um, aware that it is not something that it can just be a little one thing or it is really changing our economic um, way of, of, of working, of, 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 of functioning. And that we have to take into consideration um, both um, a trade-off between the short-term issues with the long term and so that there will have to be some very tough decisions that may impact in the short run that we're doing it for the well-being in the long run and uh, i think david also mentioned this you know how covid how the pandemic has really um made us realize or or come aware with those really specific um, multiple links between public health and the environment um, and has reminded us how healthy societies and productive economies um, really depend on on healthy environments um, so in terms of and, and lastly as, as i was saying if we are to move into a just transition if we are to go into diversification and and within the Caribbean, you know, we hear more and more about the importance of the blue economy. I mean, it is, we're surrounded by it, right? But we really need to look into it in, 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 in greater detail so that it doesn't just become what we would call blue washing, right? Where we just kind of 
put a little blue here, like we've done a little green, um, we really need to look into, for example, how is it that we are going to manage um, fishing so that our, um, our corals are not uh, affected? How do we take care of those fishers who during a certain period will not be able to fish? We need to consider those elements. And um, ILO firmly believes that in order to do that, we need to build consensus and we need to promote um, social dialogue. Social dialogue, bringing the governments, bringing the employers, so being in the private sector, but also looking at the workers themselves and for all of them to look into, okay, what is it that we can do? How can we do it? What is it that we need? And I think there as well, um, uh, and it's, you know, Parla Americas and, and US parliamentarians have a, a, a great um, role to play in, in raising these issues and in bringing those, that, that consensus and, and, and that, those discussions and those dialogues. Um, and I was just quickly looking through the, the guidelines that, that you've put forward and, you know, it's, uh, you've, it's, it's a wonderful tool, I can already say it, um, and I would just want to invite you all to have a, a look at it. Um, so from my side, that, that would be my, my answer right now, um, and, and we can continue the conversation in, in the next round of questions. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so um, the next question is to uh, Mr. Oswald. Um, what step should countries be taking to transform their economies to circular model and how can this be financed? I think this is a very dramatic question. Yes, thank you, Senator Galvis. Um, uh, so just to pick up on what I was saying, I mean, one of the key things about uh, dealing with these risks and vulnerabilities that we're obviously exposed to is an important first step is framing the problem, like framing the situation. I would say my argument is that we need to frame this in an environmental management lens or perspective, which is you know, something we do a lot of. So, uh, and, and in doing so, there is, uh, there's, there's no uh, one generic model per se uh, that certainly applies to countries throughout the Caribbean and Latin America. They're all quite distinct. So therefore, I mean, you have to contextualize it. And one thing that is consistent though is you have absolutely have to consider scale when looking at these problems. Um, and one has to look at the, the, the core idea of the circular economy, which is as much as possible to minimize damage caused by outputs of industrial and economic activity and redirect output flows such as waste uh, to input flows. We have literally a circular economy. And this type of closed loop thinking can be applied at the organization level. So like with businesses, for instance, um, and in this sense, uh, environmental management systems can be used to systematically monitor and track energy use, waste management, health and safety concerns. And one of the classic examples or standards of that is ISO 14001 or other environmental management standards. So implementing these types of EMSs at the organizational level, it really forces organizations to think in these terms. It literally, you have to document it if you're going to get certified or even claim that you have this. But at a different scale or a different level, and this is perhaps uh, equally and if not more, more relevant to parliamentarians, is to look at things at the provincial or state level or national levels. And similar thinking can occur at that level, uh, looking at how energy, uh, looking how economic inputs such as energy materials uh, are used as outputs. And this is, it's a modeling exercise. It's a way of looking at modeling your economy. So tools can be applied to promote certain behaviors at this level, such as putting disincentives on wasteful production, say carbon taxes, for instance, or taxing externalities, as they say in, in the economic vernacular, and then also incentivizing sustainable behavior. So as tax rebates or subsidies for technologies or practices that are more in keeping with uh, a circular economy. But in both cases, whether you're dealing at the organizational level or at the state level, um, you, have to, uh, you have to have data. It's essential. There's, there's just no getting around that, really. So this could be at, at, at the organizational level we've already talked about for parliaments, looking at greenhouse gas footprinting for national governments. And then also in some of the work that we've been doing uh, has been developing national uh, data management systems for MEA reporting, reporting to multilateral environmental agreements, which is heavily dependent on indicators and data. So I'll just push through one link here. Um, to give you an example of the work that we've done in St. Lucia. 
uh, which is uh, developing an NEIS for them. But you need to have the data, and this closely relates to uh, the relationship between the different S SDGs. So there's some synergy there, and we can talk more about that in the discussion. In fact, I've got some colleagues here from St. Lucia. So the other part of this question is financing, and this is the critical one, is how do we pay for this stuff? What are the economic consequences or uh, parameters? And, and frankly, I, I say to, to governments, because we work a lot with governments, is we have to be entrepreneurial about this, I would say. There is a market for sustainable development projects, and this whole area of, of work and investment is doing nothing but growing. So there's a growing demand uh, by banks and financial organizations to demonstrate sustainability in their due diligence. Um, and this is a demand put on by, uh, by many financiers. And in addition to that, we have the growing opportunity for getting financing for national governments in the developing world through multilateral funds. So I'm gonna give you some examples of programs that I think are, are, are worthy of looking at. So like the Jeff, for instance, the Global, Global Environmental Facility, uh, various multilateral development banks are increasingly looking at the circular economy as well as various types of environmental programs to provide financing to build capacity in developing countries. So you have to be entrepreneurial about positioning your country to gain access to those funds. Uh, here's one example of uh, uh, a program that I think is very cool that the IDB has put through as very recently, which is uh, their Beyond Tourism. I don't know if you're familiar with this program, but it's it's an investment fund that co-shared investment from the IDB to develop entrepreneurial activity to help move Caribbean countries post COVID and deal with some of the impacts that we've had. The other thing I will close with in terms of financing in the private sector is some very interesting trends that we're seeing with respect to the movement of private capital. So a good example of this is what uh, BNP Paribas is doing. Um, so I'll give some links here. Uh, and some of the groups we work with are actually subject to this, where they're, they're, when I say there's disincentives, they're literally divesting from heavy carbon activities such as coal power plants and so forth, and then investing or providing um, uh, reduced interest rates and so forth from sustainable uh, on, on, uh, ventures such as renewable energy. So I think in closing, I mean, you have to have environmental management systems or that kind of lens where you look at the problem and then you have to have to be uh, strategic and entrepreneurial about where you're looking about at financing, whether it be for government projects or private investment in uh, businesses that are operating within your countries. Um, back thank to you. you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, you are absolutely right. Opportunities are coming, are being offered, and uh, entrepreneurial attitudes uh, is the way to go. Uh, um, in looking for this uh, uh, green financement. Next question is to Ms. Rose Lozada. And the question is, uh, um, tourism is the most uh, important economic sector in most Caribbean countries. How can the tourism, I think you already talked, you already addressed part of this. How can the tourism sector incorporate circular economy practice and strategies into their operations? And how can public policy play a role in this. Thank you so much. Um, let me also first start off by, because by, I'm, I'm hearing David say it, and I, I do think it's, it's an important element, and, and it is the, the importance of data, right, um, when we look at anything, and, and, and how within the Caribbean that, that uh, is overall um, a challenge. Um, in terms of the tourism sector, and, and also within this very specific um, time that we were living in with, with the pandemic. Um, the ILO's uh, Office for the Caribbean back in August um, published a report on the impact of COVID um, on, on, on the sector because it is, as, as, as it's pointed out, you know, the, the main sector um, for many of the Caribbean islands. And, and just to give you again, as, um, as someone else before said, you know, the data and the facts are important. Um, you know, it contributes 30, almost a third to the GDP of, of the region. Um, it directly employs over 400,000 people. Um, and if you touch, uh, if you include the indirect, you know, it, it goes in to an average of 43%. Um, but that also, you know, is skewed in the sense that in some cases, for example, a, an Antigua and Barbuda can go up all the way to 90%. 
Um, so the, the, the impact that, um, that, that this has on, on the Caribbean is, is huge. And it's, it's um, when we look at the kind of tourism, and, and we've also been hearing it this morning, you know, I think the situation with, with the pandemic and also climate change is really putting us in a position where we need to reconsider, re rethink um, the tourism sector in, in, in the region. And, and I've heard several initiatives um, that, that push in that, in that, sec in that way, um, in, in Barbados, for example. Um, I think that, um, and, and, and it's, it's to kickstart that, that new way of looking at, at tourism. Um, a circular economy is, is a fundamental shift in the way that we produce and we consume. Um, it significantly changes the economy and the society. Moving into a circular economy, and again, I'm coming from, from the labor perspective, you know, we've estimated that worldwide it would increase, um, uh, th there would be a creation of about six to seven million jobs, um, which may not look, seem as, as a significant big number, but I think it's, it's also in terms of how a circular economy can improve the conditions of work. And that is where um, there's a lot to be done. Now, in terms of how that can be and, and you know, building off of what already has been said and it may be in different terminologies, I think it is very important that we map out the different value chains um, of that, that contribute to the tourism sector. I think we need to map out um, where are the different um, elements and where in each different uh, parts of the value chain we can introduce circular economy practices. Um, I think there's also something to be said in terms of how we um, engage with those big multinationals when they come in to invest in our countries. I think there we have discussions to be had in terms of and 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 and, and to, you know demands to be made in terms of how uh, circular economy elements can be put into um, and how they are responsible for certain elements so that you know it, it, it is their responsibility as well in, in bringing in that, that circular economy element. Um, so I, I do think that while there is no, and as it was said previously, there is no one solution or no one way of introducing circular approaches, I think that each country within how they look at, 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 at tourism, whether it's you know looking at the big cruise companies that that is a big itch element for certain, the big multi uh, tourism hotels, the even looking at the tourism guides and sector, and we have to map those out and there identify um, in the different elements how can we play into this circular economy um, elements, um, and and that does take again, um, analysis um, that takes looking into having the data, having the information to make those kind of strategies possible. Thank you. Yes, I cannot agree more with both of you by saying that we have to scale and we have to be specific to the country that we are, we are studying. Um, when I did my white paper that I share with you the um, the link, uh, I I look at what um, other countries have done and um, try to take out what it's applicable to Canada, and and so like that we can be inspired by different examples that are that are taking place uh, all uh, around the world, and. Uh, we, for example, in Canada, we, we pay a lot of subsidies to the oil and gas industry, a lot. And right now we are at the risk of having stranded assets because of the crash on the oil price. And so this brings a specific situation and context to, to us. I want to take advantage that uh, you were speaking, Mrs. Lozada, to ask you, um, um, how can circular economy and just transition strategies better integrate women and youth and promote their economic opportunities? As we know, COVID has impacted, we are all in the same storm, but we are not in the same boat. So, um, you know, uh, minorities, racialized minorities, women and children and the old people have been hit in a harder. So um, how can we help uh, women? and youth. Thank you so much for that question and, and it is a crucial question and 
I, I, I kind of feel bad saying that actually there is no silver bullet um, and that there is no one way of doing it. And, and you know, while we, you know, we may think that greening the economy will in somehow um, naturally uh, bring in those actors, it is, it, it is not being the case. And so we have to be very purposeful. Um, and we have to take it on and we have to make sure that as we look at the, um, the issues around both greening the economy and circular economy um, and all the different policies that need to be looked into and that we have to kind of work on in a coherent way that the um, issues of not only women and youth, but in some, you know, indigenous, how um, are we bringing them in um, and again, we're seeing, for example, that in, in the circular economy, I mentioned before that we're looking at about six to seven new, million new jobs. Uh, but when we look at who are you know, those that will be mostly impacted as we move towards a, a, a greener economy and a circular economy, it's really the, the mid-skilled um, employees who will be affected and that they will either be losing their jobs or that they will uh, have to move into or transition into new jobs. And we see that that is mostly a male dominated, male dominant areas. So that already there, it will be pretty, you know, it, there will be policies and it'll come pretty much more naturally that there will be looking at how do we retrain, how do we, you know, make sure that these, um, these employees have the right skills, um, the right protection as they transition into this new economy. However, for example, when we're looking at the um, tourism, um, we see that it is in the Caribbean, it is mostly uh, females. It's about 60% of those working are women. Um, and how, you know, if we are to transition into uh, introducing circular economy aspects or approaches within the, we need to see how those are going to be um, addressed um, within this population. But in terms of how do we kind of pull um, youth and women into these, into this, the, the new, let's say, sectors that would emerge. Um, again, it is that we have to um, be very aware of it. Um, it has to be something that we purposely look at because if we don't, um, it will, it, it won't happen naturally. Um, it also um, requires that, again, as we were saying before, you know, that as we map out and that we analyze the different elements that we already look into, where are these women or where are they not? Where is the youth? Where are they not? Where could they be? How do we ensure that they have um, a, a career path or, or a way of moving up along um, specific sectors so that we don't end up like we are now where we, you know, we do find ourselves uh, where sectors where there are, the women are overall or generally um, in, in lower, in the lower end of value chains um, where the working conditions and where the, um, their, their, their capacity of, of generating income is lower um, than further up the value chain. So I think again, um, it's, it's about being um, uh, that, that we make, we be conscious about it, that we understand that, you know, no matter what we do, there will be an impact on, um, on women, on men, on, and that we need to look into, if we want to make a positive pull effect, um, that there needs to be a combination of both mainstreamed, as we call it, activities, but also specific programs to support youth, to make them access the necessary um, uh, finance um, for for coming into this these econ these new sectors. The same for women. Um, how do we uh, kind of um, design our programs in a way that ensures that they are able to participate, that they are able to not only take part but be owners of their own um, of their own decisions um, and of their own income generation activities within these new sectors. Um, so, uh, like I said, um, it's, it's, it's unfortunately not, there's no silver bullet. Thank you. Thank you. I think we uh, um, attain uh, the consensus that coming out of COVID, we, we, sh we are all in favor of a clean, a smart, fair, um, 
reset of our economy and that creativity, innovation, and um, cooperations are the, are the ways to go. And um, also, we are now at the time of discussing the approach. So we have heard about uh, the using the incentive and disincentive, incentive for the good behavior, disincentive for all, um, all economic models that didn't work for us. Now, what is the role? The question for both, but I'll start with um, uh, David. How can parliamentarians support the transition to a circular economy and help transform the workforce to being more sustainable? For example, do you know of any example of parliaments using fiscal incentive and legislative mechanisms for this transition? Uh, thank you very much. I would say to summarize uh, my response uh, would be to be um, proactive and to be demanding as parliamentarians, those two things. And I'll give you two examples. So uh, in terms of being proactive, uh, and this is speaking to uh, Ms. Lozada's comments as well, like how do you address things such as uh, the need for gender empowerment and the uh, involvement in youth or increased youth engagement on these issues? Well, I think that really boils down to, in, in part, at least certainly from the par parliamentarian position, is to craft policy or policy frameworks that can actually realize those objectives. So a good example that I would like to cite is something that we worked on, which is with the government of Guyana and the United Nations Environment Program's Green State Development Strategy. So we worked with uh, the in-country UN team, and I believe Deidre is on this call, and hopefully she can contribute during our dialogue, uh, to the monitoring and evaluation, the M&E program for the GSDS. And what the GSDS is a very good example of is an evidence-based policy framework that supports a wide range of sustainable initiatives, including circular, economic, circular economic activity, but also uh, gender mainstreaming and the empowerment of youth uh, and addressing issues such as uh, green transformation, renewable energy. And what's so interesting about the GSDS is that, and similar to uh, Senator Galvis, your comment about the Canadian situation where we're heavily, heavily leveraged on you know, a fairly unsustainable source of economic activity. Well, Guyana is just entering into that potentially similar problem, right? So the issue, and, and the, the, it's a good example to look at because when we looked at that, both from an economic and indicator standpoint was the fact that we had to consider non-oil GDP as well as like a sustainable GDP and make sure that we weren't placing all our eggs on this kind of new form of economic activity that they're rolling into. So uh, I would say that be evidence-based uh, to promote these initiatives, but the parliamentary position, you can push these agendas forward and legislate them. So I'll just share the links to the GSDS, and I'm sure the representatives from Guyana are quite familiar with it. The other part of this, my response here in terms of being demanding, and this again speaks to uh, uh, Ms. Lusada's comment about um, multinationals. So when you have co corporations, either domestic or multinational corporations coming into your country or wanting to come in, be demanding with them, you know, be demanding as to what you expect in terms of how they're going to run their business. Um, and you can leverage your power uh, to, in order to do that. And I, I will give you one example because often they'll push back and say, oh, well, we can't do that. Well, the example of Puma as the company that you're probably all familiar with as a sportswear company is a really good one because they're, they're one of the most progressive companies I know out there with respect to incorporating environmental management principles to the extent to which they, have, they issue an environmental profit and loss account as well as their PL, meaning they put economic value to all of the environmental parameters that they impact or use in their production of their goods. So the water they used, the cotton they use, where they used it, and they use really practical and, and credible economic valuation from T, the economics from ecosystems and, and biodiversity as their, their benchmark. So I'll just share Puma's, uh, some links to Puma's um, work. And, and what this says to me, and in fact, I've met the, the CEO of Puma who, who spearheaded that movement, is it can be done. It needs the leadership on the part of the corporation, but also the incentive and the demands from parliamentarians for these companies to actually do that. But it's very doable and it makes a lot of sense for those companies. 
Thank you. Yes, I can I couldn't agree uh, more with you. Um, you know, in Europe, uh, the question of the multimedia and not paying taxes and force them to pay taxes, it, it proved that we can do we can do something about it. And that um, extending the responsibility of corporations post selling their products, it's, it's important to make them responsible for the ways they will eventually generate. And um, also something that I talk in, in my paper is about uh, this uh, transparency, accountability, disclosure of uh, all kinds of risk. Climate change risk, for example, in in uh, in, in some provinces in uh, in Canada, is becoming so important because of the damages of these extreme weather events taking place. Uh, Virginia, do you have something um, complementary comments to that answer? I, I think you know the, the, you. It, it, I have. I wouldn't have much to add. Um, I think that in terms of concrete examples, and we've actually been hearing some concrete examples from, um, from, for example, from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I think that just out of how this, the, these topics have evolved and where they're emerging, you know, from the European Union, there, there are quite a few examples that um, Parliament could look, Parliament Americas could look into and in which, you know, I'm probably sure that you've already done so um, in looking into how, you know, you can use both tax incentives or, or subsidies um, to kind of, promote certain elements in both how you produce, but also in terms of how you consume um, to promote a more circular economy. Thank you. Before moving to the next session, which is the dialogue with the, um, with the uh, uh, receiving question from parliamentarians, I want to ask you both panelists if you have questions to ask. Um, Virginia, do you have any question for parliamentarians? Thank you so much. I think this is, an, uh, this is a, a great um, forum to actually ask these kind of questions. And, and in terms of, from our perspective, in terms of uh, a UN agency and an international organization, you know, I would, I would just really want to hear from, from here today. It's actually, you know, what are the challenges that you as parliamentarians are facing um, in towards uh, of, of, of developing these kind of legislation, this legislation and policies, and where can you know where do you see us as as UN agencies and international organizations kind of come in to support your efforts? Um, I have my own ideas, but I really would want to hear from from the parliamentarians. Thank you so much. Okay, David, do you want to ask your questions? Yes, I, uh, I have one basic question. Um, in my experience, um, uh, political will is, uh, is one of the key ingredients for invoking a sustainable change in, in these nation states. And so I guess my main question is, do you see the political will for promoting these actions in your countries? And then what are the opportunities and also uh, the barriers that exist to, to promoting or, or developing these initiatives? Thank you. Thank you. Just want to just quickly talk about a little bit of my experience because uh, until the last parliament, I was the chair of the environment, natural resources and, uh, and energy uh, Senate committee. So I am lucky that this committee exists as a whole. So we can have this, uh, this uh, conversation of the three big subjects in one single committee and not have it as a as a silo, which I think it's a big problem, discussing these issues at silo. Um, and you're right, the political will, uh, the political will sometimes is only verbal. The political will is not necessarily in action. The, 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 the words are there, the, even the legislations are there, but then to trickle down to a, a real action, it, it takes time. But well, we, we are becoming more and more conscious, that's for sure. I know that some um, parliamentarians colleagues wants to intervene. So for example, I have Senator Sapphire Longmore from Jamaica would like to take the, uh, the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon now, everyone. Um, good morning to some still. And uh, thank you as always, Parliamerica's staff for, for significantly enhancing our, our national agendas in a very effective way. 
Um, I had one or two comments that I just wanted to make, and it's a perspective that I am possibly seeking um, how to, to, to incorporate in our circular economy and, and maybe stimulate a thought here. Um, but also before I go to that, maybe just to respond to, um, to I think it's Mr. Oswald, yeah. Um, Uh, are you hearing me? I'm getting a message that I might be muted. I can hear you. Yeah. Can hear okay. You. All right. Thank you. Right. Um, regarding the political will and, and such. And Jamaica is in a position where, as we speak, there is a current uh, controversy that is going on around a mining of, of, some, of some protected, somewhat protected area. And I say somewhat because it's not the entire area, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the challenge is very real to, to pursue economic development at a time when we are so very affected by COVID and such, but also recognizing that it is potentially not the very utmost best for the environment and being able to communicate to the people who somewhat are clearly invested in the, the, the national preservation, but also are invested in, in, in seeing good governance and economic development and economic survival through this time. And it is a challenge. This is coming from a government now where we introduce the, 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 the plastic band on, on um, reusable plastics, et cetera, et cetera, which was really very, and has been very effective, et cetera. And we are also, uh, we have signed on to, to, to ensure another very protected area that was going to be passed on to another government and, and we have moved to ensure its protection. But so there is a, it is, there is significant political will, but at the end of the day, the actual communication and somehow that genuine desire of, of politicians and governments to probably pursue the protection of the environment as being paramount, but especially with these COVID times, the great need for economic stability and opportunities is, is, really, very, is really very contrasting. And how is it that we're able to get this message across, to get the, political, the, the public support to, do, to create that balance. Um, I don't know if there is any strategies there that could be, could be shared, et cetera. But I know the Canadian authorities somehow, and the Canadian, this is one of the reasons why Canada is a forerunner in its environment and its environmental protection, but still see to positive economic growth and development. So um, I'd be curious uh, along that side, but yes, there is put political way, but it is compromised. And then just quickly in terms of um, uh, Ms. Rosa, Rose Lose, can I get full name, Rosa. sorry, Rosa. 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 Um, Rosa. And in terms of women and uh, youth, youth involvement, et cetera. And we're talking recycling and, and the circular economy, et cetera. But I think there's a big part of the circle that we, we tend to sometimes not recognize as a part of the environmental protection. And that is the environment. And I, I'm, by the way, I should, I should give the disclosure that I'm a psychiatrist. So um, I, think, I think very health oriented in, in when I review these, these subject matters. And it is the internal environment and what we take in, our nutrition, our, the, the use of our nutrition as our medicines and as our, our economic development. Because when we reduce the cost of health care, we increase economic viability and economic health. And this is an avenue that we could use in terms of sustainability. And this is where jobs could be created around for women and the youth. If there's significant benefit to, for, the, for the mental health implications of this. Mental health is one of the significant other pandemics that is coming out of COVID. And we have to come up with strategies, I think. 
And when we're thinking about a circular economy, I think we need to complete the full circle <laughs> and include us and our health in said sustainability and, and, and generativity and therein seek opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a speaker, Bridget and he said, George, please, from Trinidad and Tobago. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to add one to the conversation um, in terms of political will um, and, and say that certainly in documents, as I, I pointed out in our national environment policy, you see um, verbiage that talks about the green economy and the, the um, circular economy. And therefore, it, it, it shows, if you take it at face value, that there's political will. But I think there comes the role for us as legislators, and, and particularly, you know, we talk about our varying roles. But uh, maybe there is too much of a silo in, in our application because to me, if there is policy documents that a government has given that shows a particular direction, in our, our roles as uh, um, holding governments accountable, in our role as oversight, in, in our role as interrogating the budget and the administration of the budget. I think that's where we help in solidifying and bringing to light into reality political will. Okay, so I, I give an example. I think it would have been in last, year, but last year's budget there was a statement that uh, there would be a removal of taxes, import duties and taxes for the importation of LED bulbs. Okay, so that would have been a year ago. But to date, I can't find any proof that that has been done, that measure has been done. And therefore, where is the parliamentarian's voice in, in asking that? I think additionally, the problem we may have to in political will is the question of scale um, in terms of whether the expense in justifying new technologies is, is worth it in the short term. And I, I think um, Rosa's discussion with respect to understanding that you may have to make some short-term sacrifices for long-term benefits may be a very big issue for governments. Because, I mean, governments have to look at the next election. So, for instance, in our country, the government has taken a measure to remove the subsidies on um, gasoline and, and um, car fuels. Of course, people are not happy about that, but that also helps with consumption, okay, responsible consumption. It also helps with our um, reducing our emissions. But, you know, it is whether that one, a government is prepared to maybe suffer the, the political fallout and a question of how do you build trust in your population to understand the long-term benefits? Because let's face it, there is a philosophy of acquisition. There is a, a, a philosophy of being ostentatious that, that is in. Uh, and how does one remove those underlying beliefs 
in, in, in the short term to make something like the circular economy um, attractive. Because really and truly what we're trying to tell people is that you have to produce to ensure the longevity of a good. And again, going back to the, to, I like to use real examples. I have an uncle who had a stove that he bought in 1948, a German um, electric stove. It never needed a part. Okay, he never needed to replace anything. In fact, if he needed to replace anything, we couldn't find the parts. But that was something we would scoff at. But, but that in itself is a manifestation of, of, of the circular economy. But how do we bring about in the minds, not just of the, the, the politician, but in the minds of our populace, in the short term, the benefits of this. And tied into that is the whole question that you raised, um, David, with respect to lack of data. So, you know, uh, to me, for our societies, that while on the academic level, I can understand the benefits of a circular economy. I think that there, there are real, um, serious barriers in getting there in the short term. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, you have said so many wise things and uh, that resonate within us. Um, you know, I think that we need both. We need a change in culture. You are right. Going back to some of the old values of um, um, valuing long life of products and uh, and, uh, and instruments, and which ha we have lost for some reason. But I believe that one of the reasons because it has become less evident is because we don't see the cost of pollution. We, we don't see it. Uh, we don't know all this particulate matter in the air, how much is affecting the health and how much cost nowadays our health system. We don't see, we don't pay for the waste disposal of all the garbage that we go to landfills. So we live in a sort of a not real, not real economic world because all of these costs are hidden and, and, and if we will be charged by them, of course we will pay attention. I think it's not secret that um, wealthy people uh, produce more waste than, um, than poor people. And, uh, and we know that when there is a tragedy or a extreme weather event uh, is the vulnerable, the poor people that pays the, the big price for this. And, and, and so this is the things that we have to change by the change of mentality, the change in paradigm, the change in culture, but also with policies that are effective and that are um, implemented as they are given, not after a few years that we, we, we see. So this is the time to open to everybody's question. I want to remind my colleagues, parliamentarians, that there is a um, interpretation available in English and French. Je rappelle à mes, à mes collègues parlementaires qu'il y a de la, de la traduction um, à l'anglais et, et, vous, et que c'est disponible um, en bas de votre écran. Vous en avez uh, les icônes uh, du globe. So it's the time to ask free questions to our panelists. They are there. So I see um, um, Mr. Holder raising his hand. Do you have a question? Yes, good. The floor is yours. I have a, I have a question and I also want to make some, some very brief comments based on a couple of questions that were posed. I think the issue of political will will always remain very foremost in the, in the minds of of politicians of government because oftentimes in small open economies the the issue of 
government being seen as a continuum, all this comes to the fore. So that even if there is um, legislation on, on the statute books, um, the, at the end of a, a, a five-year term, for example, and a new government comes to the fore, the, the question is are always asked, will the new government continue the program of the previous government? Uh, and I think it calls for uh, fortitude uh, for a, a, a government to uh, continue uh, for previous policies if they're, if they're seen as progressive and conducive to the development of the country. And our, our government is a classic example. We, we came in government in, on the 25th of May, 2018. And uh, from the beginning, we, we saw the need to, to change direction relative to the circular economy. So from inception, for example, we created a, a Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Blue Economy um, so that we recognized that it was essential to, to change and shift focus. They, they saw the creation of two marine management, management areas, one on the south coast and one on the west coast, to effectively manage the, the marine space. Our marine space as it stands is 424 times the size of our land space. What we sought to, to do is to, for example, reduce overfishing and other human activity, protection of the coral reef and the fish, an imminent ban on small fish catching, and protection of healthy reef fish that produces sand and keeps balance on the ecosystem. We saw the ban on plastics, reduce the amount of petroleum-based products in circulation and movement to more sustainable products. We are currently in discussion with the National Conservancy to do an, a debt for nature swap that would allow us to manage up to 30% of our ex exclusive economic zone. This is the first uh, and the, uh, in the Caribbean of this magnitude. We, we, our aspiration is to be fossil fuel free by, or at least carbon neutral by 2020. And to show, to show that, we, that we lead by example, we have just purchased 33 new buses. All are electrical buses. The, the, our Bridgetown port is moving to, to use only clean energy to, to refuel ships. Also, again, to lead by example, the Ministry of the Environment is planting 1 million trees as part of responsible carbon sequestration. We have embarked on a, an ambitious roofs to reef program. This is a holistic integrated national initiative for, the, for resilient development. Who, who have four or five objectives outlined? One, to make low and income, to make low and middle income homes more resilient to, to extreme weather events. Obviously, this is because we are in the hurricane belt and the, from June, from November, right, from September to November, we are, we are prone to be affected by hurricanes. Two, to increase fresh water, fresh water stores capacity and, and water use efficiency. Three, to reduce carbon emissions through the deployment of our distribution of of renewable energy generation. Four, to decrease land-based sources of marine pollution. Five, to decrease land-based sources of, mar of marine pollution. Six, to make critical utility water and sanitation and road infrastructure climate resilient. And, six, and seventh, to restore the reduced coral reef ecosystem services, particularly on the western south coast on, on the island. This obviously is because we are tourist oriented. And unless we can improve these things, then post COVID 19, post COVID 19, our, our country will, will be in trouble. We understand and recognize the, the fallout from tourism. So, so, as a result, we are moving full speed ahead to ensure that these systems are, are in place. Uh, that is part of my, of my program for, for, for Barbados. And 
and to ensure that we we understand the, the damage done by the linear model and understand and appreciate that the circular the circular economy is the only way to go if we are to prosper. I thank you kindly. Thank you very much, Arthur. Um, do the panelists want to react to, to those comments? Rosa, can I, I pose a quick question? Yes, 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 Mark. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Senator Galvez, and, and uh, thank you to the panelists uh, for your very insightful presentation. Um, um, I'll just quickly hear, um, you know, I'm part of the Natural Resources Committee. Uh, uh, mining is, is a big um, part of uh, Northern Ontario and obviously tourism. Um, and uh, I wanted to ask a few questions. One is, um, what further, uh, as you know, Canada is uh, uh, banning single-use plastic in 2018, uh, but obviously we're getting, um, you know, quite a bit of resistance on that. Um, but um, from the industry, but uh, I wanted to ask a few questions. One is when you mentioned about data, and, and no one's going to disagree with that. Data is so important. But when we look at from the UN perspective or, or global data from Canada, but also do you have any recommendations linked to data regionalized? Um, and how do we get uh, our universities involved? And when we look at the circular economy, uh, a link to that. So, so kind of that regional aspect, in my case, obviously, Northern Ontario, but but regionalize is so crucial. And I like to go back to um, um, Sapphire's on Jamaica's comment and, uh, um, and um, Senator um, uh, Brigitte from, um, uh, Speaker Brigitte from Trinidad, when we look at public trust and, and, and public support, how do we try and, and um, how, how can we do a better job on that? Um, as you know, um, you know we, in Canada, we got carbon pricing and uh, green tech initiatives. Uh, but we're getting a lot of pushback and, and politically, yes, political will is there, but also there's electability and, 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 and being in government to make those changes. Um, so, so I just wanted to get some, some comments um, from you along those lines. Thank you, merci. Thank you, Mark. That's a very good question. Um, um, David, you want to answer first? Um, sure, okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, honorable participants for the comments. Uh, I've made some notes here, so I'm gonna try and weave together a, <laughs> it's a lot of different things we brought to the table here. So I'm gonna start with um, uh, Representative Safar Longmore from Jamaica uh, with the mining issue. And this sp also speaks to Monsieur Soye, uh, your, your issue as well, your comment. Um, <clears throat> so, how do we uh, balance economic development with environmental responsibility is essentially what the key point there is. And I think uh, Canada is a very good example. I mean, let's, let's be honest uh, about uh, Can Canadian economy. Like we are rocks, uh, sticks, and, uh, and oil in the ground. I mean, not completely, but that's a big part of our economy, natural resources. And we've got a long history of investing uh, in policy development and world-class capability with respect to forestry and mining and so forth in terms of our knowledge. But at the end of the day, I mean, you're faced with the situation of whether or not you're gonna develop natural resources for economic gain or you're not going to do that. And if you're going to do that, which we're forced to do, you know, in, in many cases, you have to do that in a way uh, that does balance that. And I'll go back to my initial comments is environmental management plays a very critical role in that. And so um, there are some really good examples. There's something called Towards Sustainable Mining, which is an industry framework that's been established within Canada uh, that outlines parameters where, where we can uh, fully understand the risks and the impacts of mining operations and reduce those. So I would say, like, say from a situation like Jamaica, where you, know, you may have new developments that are being proposed, and I completely, our business partner is in Jamaica at Mono Geomatics Institute, so we, I'm quite familiar with the situation in Jamaica. You need to have economic development, but if you have companies coming in that are proposing to do this type of development, you need to demand that they have world-class um, environmental management systems put in place. So there's the onus that you need to put on the companies I think is, is one of the key and critical components there. And there's some very good examples of best practices out there. And then the other component I think that's key to that point is to, and this also speaks to public engagement, is to ensure that within, as parliamentarians, that your environmental impact assessment processes 
are sound, that they have uh, proper public engagement and stakeholder involvement, and that they're transparent. And I think the Canadian government deserves uh, a lot of credit in this regard because we've recently gone through an expert panel review of our EA processes and really revamped our legislation with a heavy emphasis on stakeholder involvement. And I, I think we deserve a, deserve a lot of credit for that, particularly with respect to the involvement of First Nations, which is a big issue and a major directive in our country with respect to reconciliation. So I would say those two, two points for the mining issue, and just to pick up on the other points uh, about um, building trust, but then I, I, one of the key points that Senator Galvis made was making these costs visible. You know, we live in an economy right now where externalities are invisible. The full cost of these activities are not accounted for. And so the example I've given you with Puma as a private sector company is a great example of a company that sees it not only it's, they're not doing it for social license purposes. Let's be clear about this. I literally talked to the CEO who started that program. His response, so this is at, Rio de, at the Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012 in Rio de Janeiro, when I asked him why they do that, he said, we do it for risk management. It wasn't because they want to be seen as the best, most green retail sports company. That's obviously a part of it. But what they really want to have a handle on is where their risk gets exposed. In this day and age, they need to know where they might be um, suffering economically as a business due to the next drought, due to the next whatever in all the countries in which they're doing business. And then the last point I'd like to respond to, uh, and that also this this putting economic values to this, I think speaks to Speaker Holder's comments from Barbados, which is great to hear that you're working with TNC on the debt for nature swap, debt for conservation swap, because that's groundbreaking work that they've been doing in, I believe in, in Maldives or Seychelles, they've done some work there, but that exactly is doing that. That's putting an economic value to conservation programs and doing it in a very transparent and professional way. And TNC is world-class at that kind of work. And the last point I'd like to respond to is uh, from uh, uh, Representative Saray from Northern Ontario. So how do you deal with the data issue from a regional standpoint? And this is a good point because it's, I mean, at an, at an organizational level, you can say these companies need to have an environmental management system or what have you. Uh, at a national level, say for instance, the work we've done in St. Lucia, we're doing in Antigua right now, they're small countries, but you have these national programs, but in, in a country as the size of Canada, we, you know, you need to have regional systems in place. And I think it's very important to do that. I think that can be done at the provincial level where you involve uh, uh, universities in helping develop these. I would say involve NGOs as well. So IISD is a good example, the IECN. Uh, but, and I think that, so how do you sell something like that? You need to pay for it, right? There needs to be funding for those systems to be implemented. Uh, I would say that you could put the argument forward for something like that um, federally to the federal government um, on the purposes of supporting cumulative effects assessment. Because another point that came up uh, in, in terms of um, impact assessment, environmental impact assessment, is to have a very good handle on CEA, cumulative environmental effects of multiple different projects, say in a region where you have a mining operation here, oil and gas over here, or what have you. I mean, it's, it's mandated by our environmental impact assessment process. And it's, it's been a problem for 20 plus years doing CEA effectively. And the only way you can do that is by having regional platforms that can aggregate data from different stakeholders. So I think you can make the argument for doing that based on the mandate that we've set forward in our environmental impact assessment legislation and the push federally uh, for sustainable development of natural resources. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Virginia? Do you have uh, something to, yes? Thank, thank you. you so much. No, just, just to uh, build on, on that last question around data and, and kind of linking with some of what um, was being said about uh, making um, it visible, the, the, Im the, the, the impacts of, of, of climate change. And I think it's the same thing with the kind of data. I mean, we can't, if what, what we can't measure, we can't do anything about. Um, and I think there is a, a, a fair, case to be made um, as parliamentarians of the need for data. And while it is a cost and that the, you know, but we need to um, build the capacity of the Bureau of Statistics at a national level for that gathering of information. Um, I mean, we often hear within, within the ILO, we, we are asked for statistics and, you know, it, it, it gets to a point where, well, 
we, we have the statistics that we get from countries and how we can make those kind of projections. And so in a way, you know, it's, it's just again making that point that um, in order to make things visible, um, the best way to do that is data. And so while it can be seen as um, investing in something that is not, you know, all that useful, um, I would actually counter argue that, you know, if we don't have that data, then we can't really make sound uh, judgments and analysis um, to, to found our policies. Thank you. Um, this discussion reminds me, um, some years ago, I was asked to evaluate uh, a project that was presented for financement between a company that collects waste and a company that uh, fabricates balance. And they were proposing that uh, waste, the production of waste should be charged depending on how much is produced. And, um, you know, so you have um, um, a company that will collect the waste in every house and you have a company that will develop a, a balance within the arm of the truck that will weight that. And uh, with digital technology will identify the house and so the house will be charged on the production of waste. And those ones that recycle and do other things will be pay less. At that time, this technology on digitalization was not there, but today we, we see a lot of development in the digital world. And I think we are not collecting the fruits that are ripe for being collected. Um, another one field that I know very well that uh, it uh, it's exists and we can do is the building codes because we have a lot of energy waste and we have a lot of construction waste that can be recycled. So these are low hanging fruits that uh, can be easily implemented because the knowledge is there, technology is there and doesn't require a lot of capital. but Again, we go back to the to the um, political will, and I know and I understand that there are people that has to think in the four year term because they have to be reelected. But I think that then, you know, I'm putting that in my back and say the ones that we are there for longer time, like the senators in my case, well, it's me to push harder. And so I'm coming out of this um, very interesting discussion of assuming more responsibility as, uh, as legislators and as leaders in our respective countries. Um, I want to invite the youth leaders that are there because we are leaving the planet for them and that we are discussing many things in Canada, like such, for example, reducing the age of voting. Um, we are having people discussing it. Should we bring it down to 16? Because around the world, we see that the youth is getting um, uh, worried about what is what we are leaving to them. Is there any of uh, the youth leaders that wish to take the, the floor? Maybe Annabella can help me and uh, signal me who are the leaders. I think is Gladys there? Or uh, I think Laurel too? No, okay. So it does. Um, okay. So Hi, I'm here. Oh, yeah, Gladys. Thank you. Do you have a question for our panelists? I think um, representing the Council for Youth Prosperity, my question for the panelists are. How can we get our parliamentarians and elected officials to create more space for youth voices in exploring these issues? This, this topic of the circular economy is a fascinating one and a really interesting approach that many young people we work with will be interested in. But how do we create the space um, to, for more youth voices to explore these potential options? 
Great question. Virginia, you want to go first? It's a, it's a great question and I think it's, it's in a way it's what we're doing right now, but I think it's, it's sometimes um, in my, my, uh, my own work, um, including, for example, youth into the spaces, it actually becomes an afterthought. Um, I would actually invite the youth to set the agenda and invite us to the table um, and that they set the agenda. Um, I think that often it is, you know, we, 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 like right now, we talk and then we bring them along at the end. Um, whenever I, I organize events, I actually, you know, open and I give the floor to the youth, to the young people to express where they want the discussion to happen, where they want, um, where they want action, where they want uh, responsibility, you know, for them to take on responsibility in certain areas. And, and it's around that, then, then we discuss how we contribute to that. Um, but it is, again, it's, 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 it is, again, just making youth participate in all of these discussions. Um, and it's not participate in a, in a meaningful way, huh? not in terms of just having them as, as, as listeners. Thank you, David. Um, thank you very much for that, uh, that comment. I think it's incredibly important. I, that's one of the points that I, I didn't raise with respect to community or public awareness about the environmental parameters. Now I'm an, I'm an associate prof, uh, uh, was at Concordia University for a while and now at Royal Roads University. So I deal with, you know, young people and youth quite a bit in terms of my teaching. So I keep my, my hand in that, but I have to say hats off to youth. Um, for the voice that you're bringing to these issues right now. Um, for instance, um, in Canada, for those that aren't familiar with um, the degree to which we've had um, marches uh, for the climate, like in Montreal, for instance, and uh, I guess this speaks also to the issue about how, how much longevity do these, these policy initiatives have? You know, governments get unelected or they get elected. Um, the thing is, with this amount of public pressure that's put on um, public bodies, like in Canada, for instance, on climate change, I mean, it's, it's an unavoidable issue for any government that gets in power, a majority conservative, minority liberal, a co whatever, whatever the government is, they have to pay attention to this issue. It's, it's so very obvious from the fact that uh, the, the, the high degree of, of public involvement on the part of youth. So I, just making your voice heard, I think is very important. You're doing a fantastic job of that. The other thing I would say is that perhaps what, what parliaments can do a better job of perhaps, and at least in, in Canada's case, doing a pretty good job, is involving, involving youth groups uh, in some of the important discussions and dialogues at the international level. So I always get inspired when I go to the COP conferences for climate change or biodiversity or land degradation, more so in climate change and biodiversity. That's where I see the most youth involvement. And I see um, youth groups that are brought to the table to have their voices heard at the international level on the part of, say, a Canadian youth group and being able to speak uh, to the plenary at these conferences. So I would say if we can create more voice at the inter on the international stage uh, at, for different governments, say, for instance, the government of Barbados uh, having, uh, along with your focal points, having input from youth groups within your country at those dialogues, I think it sends a great message, not only to the international community, but also sends a great message to youth saying like, look, we take what you're saying seriously. We want you to involve you in representing our country or have your voice heard on the part of our country at these important international dialogues on these pressing issues that are related to sustainable development. So I think that's something that can be done. Uh, I've seen it happen. I'd like to see more of it. Thank you. I think so we much. have... Thank you. Do you have another um, another question? Um, what? Gladys, was it Gladys? Yes. Do you have another uh, another question? No, that was it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the feedback and thank you for welcoming uh, CCYP to this forum. We really appreciate it. Okay. So I think we have exhausted the questions. Um, I will give the floor to uh, Alicia 
for the closing remarks. Thank you, Senator Galvez. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Senator Galvez, for a uh, wonderful moderation uh, of, of that session, of the dialogue session, and to our panelists, as well as the parliamentarians who contributed uh, their reflections. Um, before we move into the closing, and, and, and congratulations to all, because I know we all have all of these back-to-back -back Zoom meetings and we are on time, and that is always a wonderful thing too, because it is very challenging for us to kind of keep all of our work going through these sessions. Um, I would like to though invite everyone, first of all, we need to do is the evaluation. So our work is financed through Global Affairs Canada uh, for this particular uh, activity. And so as a part of that, we do like to get an evaluation done that allows us to make sure that the work that we're doing uh, is rewarding to those involved in it, that we are getting your feedback to ensure um, that we are uh, creating programming that is helpful to you. Uh, and then David, I see your point and yes, I will make sure once we finish this evaluation, um, we can do that. Uh, so please, if colleagues are uh, grateful on the screen, you see it up there, please do me a favor and fill in. It's a little bit of a poll here just to make sure that you find the work useful. Um, and there's always opportunities to email us if you ever need it to, you want to add something to our agenda, um, we can always be reached at Parlo Americas to say these are the kinds of things that I wish Parlo Americas was engaging with. Challenges is our Zoom technology evaluations provide us less opportunity to get your, your written feedback the way we used to do in the in-person meetings. <laughs> and so I'll just give it a few minutes here to let uh, my colleagues finish this up. Can I just say that I really appreciated this um, topic and I thank so much all the um, the panelists, but all my colleagues. Really, thank you so much, Alicia, and all the staff and from uh, Parla Americas in the organization. And looking forward to continue in this very important subject. Thank you, Senator Galvez. And thank you for contributing um, your white paper, uh, an excellent resource for all of us. I really look forward to reading it. Um, our, look, the work is only uh, as, uh, is all enriched uh, by everybody who contributes. So this is wonderful discussion. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, perfect, thank you, Gladys. I did have a note before we move into the, to, to the last bit here. I had a note from uh, David Oswald. I think David, you said you have a, a colleague on the, on the call that you would like to maybe uh, invite to, to contribute a, uh, something for us. Yeah, if I may, I think it would be valuable. Uh, I know that we're, we're short of time, but uh, I've invited two colleagues, one from the UN office in Guyana, uh, who uh, we worked together, Deidre Sherland on the GSDS. And I, I would, she would have some very, very uh, beneficial comments about some of the, the barriers that one ex uh, encounters, particularly when you come to like broad policy initiatives and budget reality. So if, if, if Deidre, if, if you are able to provide some insights, I think it would be very beneficial. And the other colleague I invited uh, is Alejandra from uh, the UNEP office, uh, ROLAC, uh, and they've been doing some, UNEP has been doing some very interesting global work on the circular economy. So if we have time for just two brief interventions, I think we'd all benefit from their, their points if they're able to share some insights. Absolutely. Uh, colleagues, you are welcome to take the floor. Deidre? If they'd like to. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Deidre Sherlam. I, I have to say that David is, is twisting my arm a bit to participate. I was very content to listen to the exchanges but I work for UN Environment based here in Georgetown, Guyana, and we completed the, over the past couple of years, the Green State Development Strategy, which was a national development strategy. And, and David's work was about putting together, as he indicated, the monitoring and evaluation framework, which the country never really had. And that was linked to a very detailed cost estimate exercise of all the policy recommendations that, that we made for the Green State strategy. And it was very intense work, as you can imagine, sitting with the staff. And, and where they struggle really is moving from policy to strategy to practice, essentially. And it sounds strange and a little bit counterintuitive to say this, 
but as, um, as Ms. Susanna said, George had indicated, she sees in her parliament, and I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, but, but she saw in her parliament evidence of, I mean, the legislation has passed, but, and the incentive scheme are put in place, same here in Guyana, but few people know about it, and the ministries are not really organized to pick it up, essentially, and to drive that transformation and in drive and use the incentives regime to drive and transform their sectors. So they really struggle with this because I think that uh, they have gotten into a, a pretty entrenched habit of hiring the consultants to prepare the strategies. But when it comes to implementing through the bureaucracy, it's very, very difficult and very resistant to change. And it does require um, a fairly coherent and fairly strong leadership at the level of, of the cabinet, obviously, and at the level of the ministers and their, and their machinery, their hierarchy in the ministries, but also from the standpoint of parliament and keeping the voice of the people there and, and, and using parliament as an accountability mechanism to receive reports to indicate the progress of the national development strategy. So, uh, and, and one of the other tools that we left uh, with the Ministry of Finance here in Guyana is uh, a medium-term expenditure framework, which it had been weakly doing in a sort of, of fudgy way, but we developed a very, um, a very precise mechanism for estimating and, and projecting some costs out and, their, and by their choice about a four-year four um, span so that they can see in, in a five-year cycle, for instance, what the likely expenditures are and what the strategy is for um, accomplishing this, the, 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 the strategic plans and so forth. So I'll, I'll just leave it there unless there's a specific question and I thank you for accommodating me. Highly appreciate it. Thank you, Deidre. Um, and if I may, I don't know if Alejandra is able to provide um, some insights on some of the, I, they've been doing some tremendous work on circular economy and even just a short uh, overview or explanation of that would be perhaps helpful. Yes, so good morning, everybody. I am Alejandra Fernandez. Nice to meet you all. I'm very happy to be here and, and I really um, appreciate this important spaces. Um, that allow us to learn on the different initiatives, uh, programs, and, and ideas in circular economy. And that actually circular economy is having at this momentum uh, worldwide. And thank you, David, for, for um, inviting us here. As, as David says, um, we're working very, very hard on circular economy in the, in the regional office of Latin America and the Caribbean and the a United Nations Environment Program. Uh, we were developing and consolidating the Latin America and the Caribbean Regional Coalition on Circular Economy, uh, which it's, it, it, it surges because, um, I mean, we, we, we know that we need to develop a common regional vision and perspective and an integrated uh, approach that expands not only the national efforts, but also the regional efforts on circular economy. And that's why uh, we have this uh, coalition circular economy, which we, aims to, which we aim to launch next year on the Forum of Ministers. Uh, this coalition, well, is made up for international organizations, uh, for government institutions, and expects to uh, promote the circular economy. Uh, with the aim to share knowledge, tools, and studies to support a transition on, on this object. Um, and I mean, in recent years, we have seen that in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, the region has been very active in promoting the circular economy, and countries are already uh, interested or developing or are already developing their strategies, uh, plans, or, or programs or roadmaps in circular economy. I'd like to share, for example, that Colombia uh, has been the first country in the region and launching their, their national strategy and circular economy back in 2018. Chile is also developing their roadmap on circular economy. 
Ecuador has recently finished their first phase of the white book on circular economy as well. Peru, Costa Rica, Mexico. I mean, I can count some other countries that are moving forward uh, in the subject. So as you can see, the region is working on circularity and, and our work from UNEP besides this coalition and circular economy is also um, working in different projects and reports, for example, in electronics, in which we take into account the entire value chain. One of the aims that we also have with the coalition is also demystifying that circular economy is only about um, waste management and recycling. We, we have this view and this perspective that we need to take into account the life cycle uh, approach and uh, in the entire value chain. And, and we're based in three main principles, like designing out waste and pollution, uh, keeping materials uh, in, the use, in use in their highest value, uh, but also regenerating, regenerating natural systems. So yes, I mean, I, doing uh, some sort of a quickly overview of the coalition, uh, but I mean, I'm glad to answer you any question you might have on the coalition, or in any other topic or work we're doing from UNEP on circular economy. And well, thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandra. Thank you, Alejandra. And thank you, David, for introducing us to Alejandra. Alejandra, we're delighted to hear about the coalition from Parla Americas. And I know that my colleagues and I will be in, in, in touch with you about that. As you know, we cover the region, Latin America and the Caribbean. Well, all of the Americas in the Caribbean, Canada included in that. And, uh, and we always look for, for good partnerships in the region. So, so please look forward to having uh, my office be in contact with, with yourself. Um, I'll take this opportunity then to remind everyone actually um, that this, uh, today's session is actually a part of a series. So Parliament America's Plenary Assembly, which is the annual general meeting of our members uh, due to COVID, as we announced at the beginning, is, is being done virtually through a series uh, of, um, of sessions. So today's session was here uh, kind of engaging our members from uh, Canada and the Caribbean. And actually coming up on Friday would be the Spanish and Portuguese language sessions uh, that we're doing. We're engaging our colleagues from, um, from our Latin American uh, uh, counterparts. Um, so Alejandra, I'll also make sure that you're um, invited to that session so that you can uh, listen into that session as well and, and, um, and hear from our Latin American uh, colleagues um, and the work they're doing. And the idea was to have two kind of working sessions that uh, provided opportunity for this kind of space of dialogue without too much interpretation um, to culminate in actually uh, next Friday. So I do invite everyone here in this call um, in fact, you're already pre-registered, but we'll send you reminding, a, a reminder link at the time, but on Friday, the 27th of November, uh, oh, sorry, I might have the date. Wait a second. I think it's the 27th. Yes, Na Annabella, nod to me, yes, but I got yes. the date right. Yeah. Good. Uh -huh. Also in my head, I was like, wait, Friday, the 27th of November would be the uh, last day uh, of our plenary assembly where it'll be a dialogue. It'll be the entire hemisphere. We'll have um, interpretation until our four working languages, English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish. And so likewise, I remind all to come to that final session of the Plenary Assembly, which will continue uh, the important work we're doing on circular economy. And with that, though, I know that we are at the end of the time we have, and I know I have Senator Henfield from the Bahamas on standby <laughs> to give us our closing remarks. And um, so I'd like to invite uh, the Senator Henfield, um, because uh, who, who, thank you so much, Senator, for, for joining us, because I know at the beginning, um, uh, Senator Galvez noted uh, Speaker Daniel, but unfortunately, as we were saying at the very beginning, Speaker Daniel had uh, been uh, engaged from St. Lucia to, to, to give us our closing remarks. And he had, uh, due to the massive rainstorms in St. Lucia yesterday, has flooding in his home, and so was unable to join us today. And Senator Henfield, we're so thankful uh, that as always you are here to help and and and, and engage with us um, and and to step in and give us our closing remarks so i pass the floor to you sir thank you again for everyone for being here with us today senator henfield are you there i can't quite I hear something, but not you. 
No, well, very, very quietly. Do you have your... I am connected. Let me know if you're hearing me better now. It's, it's very, very faint. Are you able to get closer to, to the device? Device right in front of me. <laughs> well, then I can't answer it. <laughs> so, let's see if we can give it a shot with another device in two seconds. Perfect. All right. Well, in which case, that helps me out because I had forgotten. Senator Longmore, you had mo mentioned to me that you had uh, one comment that you'd like to make. Please. Please make your comment while we wait for Senator Henfield to get himself ready here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, it's just, it's actually related to the discussion before from when um, Representative Holder had made his comment and also related, I think, to, to what the panelists were, were, one of the panelists mentioned regarding the legislative challenges um, that we may face in, in seeing the circular economy. And it caused me to just wonder, maybe put it out there, is it that we're at the point where the environment is of such great import that we have to consider that this legislation becomes cross-cutting for, for the change of government? Um, is it that we have to start really thinking about the legislative agenda that, that, put, that puts the economy even above governance change and that this becomes targeted objectives for our nations as especially us in the very vulnerable um very vulnerable sites because you know it it is not going to get much better and i think we need to remove the environment from being somewhat of a political football if someone chooses to use it as such um and i'm wondering if 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 this has been thought of or or just to stir the, th the thinking. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We hear you perfectly now, Senator. And I do apologize. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone from across the region from the Bahamas. Uh, my thoughts and prayers are with Speaker Daniel and the people of St. Lucia. So on behalf of Pal Americas, I would first like to re reiterate our gratitude for your participation in our first working session of the 17th Pal Americas Plenary Assembly, hosted by the Legislative Assembly of Costa Rica, which I was so looking forward to being this year, um, since we were in Paraguay from last year. So to our panelists, I have to say you did a remarkable job in sharing policy suggestions, experiences, and facts to back them up. Additionally, we appreciate the reality check that this pandemic has exposed the cracks in our socioeconomic systems and how unresilient we are. All of us are in the same storm, but as was said earlier, we may be on different boats. Yet, all of us realize now more than ever as parliamentarians and citizens that our individual success depends on our national and regional success. To our regional colleagues, your presence, participation, and your interventions demonstrate your passion and commitment to using data, collaborating, and co-creating policies that will progress our people and our region. As we have all heard, our colleagues from Guyana, Colombia, Jamaica, Trinidad, and Barbados who have spoken, but they are just examples of the passion and political will across this region. And I pray that we continue these discussions as like-minded regional leaders and strike that balance with pursuing economic development while protecting our environment with special emphasis on co-creating the policies with our women, our young people, and our people from all communities, not just the politically connected. So obviously, this working session has certainly led to some rich insights and perspectives of how our region can transition from a linear economy, take actions to improve our country's consumption and production practices, and to contribute to a healthier environment and more equitable world. This crisis, as we all know, triggered by COVID-19, has accentuated the need to build on such policies and transform current development models to address existing systematic injustices by working to reduce some, working to reduce income inequality, committing to end corruption, ensuring access to decent work, and ensuring that gender equality is at the core of these actions. It is certain that the choices made today will play a critical role in shaping the outlook for the future 
and the level of economic and environmental burden that will be put on youth and future generations. Our takeaways, as we all know, the dialogue today highlighted the economic and social value of promoting research, development, innovation, and financing to stimulate transition processes to circular economic models and the creation of green and decent jobs. It also highlighted the importance of establishing initiatives and policies that favor a just and inclusive transition to ensure that workers in unsustainable industries are not left behind. Additionally, we highlighted the need to empower and ensure an intersectional representation of youth, women and girls, indigenous peoples, and other historically marginalized populations in decision-making processes, ensuring that solutions for these population groups are co-created with them. We encourage you all today to add any additional takeaways you may have found and share them with your parliamentary colleagues and the citizens in your respective parts. As a reminder, as we conclude this meeting, I would like to encourage all of you, and again, while Speaker Anna said George shared them earlier, I would like to encourage everyone to read and share the two new Paul Americas publications, one on green economic recovery post COVID-19, currently available in English, but soon to be launched in all Paul Americas languages, which provides a brief synopsis of the reasons for which a green economic recovery is essential for a more equitable and environmentally sound future and guides parliamentarians on supporting this endeavor. And secondly, the Guide on Green Parliaments, which outlines actions that parliaments can take to apply green practices within our institutions. Both publications are available on the Parliament America's website and their links have been shared in the Zoom chat since earlier. Finally, I would like to notify everyone that the key takeaways of this working session will be incorporated in the declaration for the 17th Parliamentarius Plenary Assembly. A draft version will be sent by email next week to parliamentary delegates for their consideration and will be officially read and proposed for adoption at the plenary session. With this, I give my final thanks to everyone. I wish you a good day. And I look forward to seeing you all again on the 27th of November for the final session of the 17th Paul Americas Plenary Assembly, which will gather all of our Paul Americas member parliaments and will take place in all four of its official languages. Again, it's always a pleasure to hear from you all, to learn from you. Have a great day. Thank you, Senator Henfield. Thank you, colleagues, everyone here. Um, as a reminder, uh, the information, because I know uh, David as well as um, uh, Virginia and, and ourselves and Senator Galvez, we all shared links of important resources, of tools. These will all be uh, captured and shared with all participants here. We always kind of report out of this, and so those links will be shared with all of you. Um, and, uh, and we hope connections have been made here. And if there's any reasons that you'd like to connect with either David or Virginia, I'm sure we can help facilitate that too for any of our parliamentarians. Um, certainly fascinated by the level of work being done um, by, by uh, David in the Caribbean. So thank you so much for sharing all of all the very concrete, concrete examples of the work you're doing in the Caribbean. Senator Longmore, you gave us provocative thing to think about at the very end there. And so I'm sure we'll bring it up then um, in all of our work, but at, at the next session too, but we'll make sure we take, uh, we've taken note of it. Um, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time and I think no longer able to have a dialogue on that point uh, for here, but we have the next meeting and so we can uh, kind of make sure we bring it up there as well. Um, thank you all colleagues uh, with that. I, I wave to you, I salute you all. I wish we were together Bye. in, thank in you. Costa Rica. Thank you. Keep safe everyone. Mm -hmm.